Phil is uh, a pleasure to interact with this uh, eclectic assembly and, uh, and see so many people interested in this subject. And I've been listening attentively. Stuart kindly offered me his sofa uh, in case I needed to sleep off the jet lag, but I actually found the conference compelling listening. So I've been here all afternoon. Of course, when they invited me to the Meridian Center, they did promise me a holiday. But this is the one I got. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good to see you all, and I, I do want to say that uh, as India, what was it Frank said, uh, Frank Wisner is a rising power of the 21st century, and clearly a lot of the focus has tended to be on that rise in conventional terms, our consistent economic growth over the last couple of decades. There's even been, I think, some slightly loose talk of India as a future world leader or even some appalling voices uh, speaking of the next superpower alongside the other Asian giant, China. In fact, the publishers uh, of my 2007 book, The Elephant, the Tiger, and, and, the, and the Cell Phone, which is about the transformation of India, the American publishers added a rather gratuitous subtitle that I didn't know about until the book came out here, uh, that it was about the emerging 21st century power. Uh, this whole no notion of great power status for India has always bothered me because I find the whole notion of world leadership in that sense a curiously archaic one, redolent of Kipling ballads and James Bondian adventures. I mean, what makes a country a world leader? Um, I mean, the one area in which we will be claiming that distinction is in population because we're going to be overtaking China around 2026. Uh, to become the most populous country on the planet, and all the demographic projections suggest we'll stay number one till uh, sometime in the very end of the of the 21st century. Uh, but in every other respect, I think we have we have pretty big challenges that we need to uh, to to think about. And um, I certainly have very little patience for talking about things like superpower status when we're still super poor. Uh, many of us still are super poor, and there's a great deal that needs to be done uh, to feed, educate, and employ all of our people before we have any of those aspirations. So bottom line, when I speak of India's role in the world, I tend not to think so much of the economic growth, the military strength, or the population numbers. What I would rather focus about, if you want to see India setting an example in any useful way, is indeed its soft power. And I think that that's really what today's discussions on various aspects of cultural diplomacy have been all about. And, um, and I would go so far as to say that I think Meridian has done a very good job in, in seizing on this as a prism through which to view India, because in many ways, to my mind, it is the most relevant. Now, of course, the notion of soft power is no longer particularly new in international discourse. Uh, my old friend Joe, Joe Nye from Harvard came up with it about a couple of decades ago, 25 years ago, mainly to describe the extraordinary strengths of the United States that went well beyond American military dominance. Now I argued, of course, that what is power? Power is the ability to alter the behavior of others to get what you want. And there are basically three ways of doing that. There's coercion, sticks. There's payments or inducements, carrots. And then there's attraction, and that's soft power. I mean, put that way, it seems very simple, but it, it makes sense. I mean, if you're able to attract others, you can economize on the sticks, sticks and the carrots. Um, and traditionally, power in world politics um, had always been seen in military terms. Um, the side with a larger army was always supposed to win. But of course, we knew by the time Nye wrote his book that that was no longer true. The US, let's face it, lost the Vietnam War. The Soviet Union was defeated in Afghanistan. And of course, even in Iraq, uh, 10 years after Nye wrote his book, uh, the US discovered the wisdom after taking Baghdad so easily, uh, but then facing all the problems it did face, it discovered the wisdom of Talleyrand's uh, adage that the one thing you cannot do with a bayonet is to sit on it. So, um, so this is why soft power was always important, that is that it was an alternative to hard power and a complement to it. And if I can quote Nye, and I, his words, the soft power of a country rests primarily on three resources, its culture in places where it's attractive to others, its political values, 
when it lives up to them at home and abroad, and its foreign policies when they are seen as legitimate and having moral authority, unquote. I'd go slightly beyond that. A country's soft power, to me, emerges from the world's perceptions of what that country is all about. The associations and attitudes conjured up in the global imagination by the mere mention of a country's name is often a more accurate gauge of its soft power than a dispassionate analysis of its foreign policies. Because in my view, hard power is exercised, soft power is evoked. Now, of course, uh, when I first came up with the theory, the US was seen as the archetypal exponent of soft power because the US is the home of Boeing and Intel, of Google and the iPod, Microsoft and MTV, Hollywood and Disneyland, Coke, Jeans, McDonald's, Starbucks, you name it, in most of the major products that dominate daily life around our globe, which are attractive around the world and the attractiveness of those assets and of the American lifestyle of which they are emblematic, is that they pers help persuade others to adopt the US's agenda. That was a theory anyway, rather than re relying purely on the dissuasive or, or, or the pure force elements of hard power. Now, as I said, that's a theory. It didn't always work that way. In a world of instant mass communications enabled by the internet, countries are increasingly judged by a, a global public fed on an incessant diet of internet news, televised images, video take, videos that are taken on the cell phones of passers-by at some incident, email gossip, some of which I hear leaks. Uh, now, Yusuf, he didn't need that. I take it back. Now, the truth is that the truth is that I've been there before you, so take it in stride. But the truth is that the steep uh, decline in America's image and standing after 9/11 um, in those few years, and Stuart was representing the U.S. at that time, so I hope you won't take this too hard. Uh, was that the, 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 um, the global distaste that arose for the instruments of American hard power, the aftermath of the invasion, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, torture, rendition, Blackwater's killings of civilians, all of that stuff, inevitably corroded the appeal of the soft power. You think, for example, of the, the outpouring of support for America after 9-11. Uh, Lamon saying, we are all Americans now, Indeed, a couple of hours after it happened, I said on CNN, we're all New Yorkers. Uh, and, and in many ways, this spirit was, um, was, was widespread around the world. But one could argue that that spirit was squandered by America's over-reliance on hard power. After all, uh, uh, fans of American culture don't necessarily um, feel prepared to overlook uh, Guantanamo or using Microsoft Windows doesn't predispose you towards supporting extraordinary rendition. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, sometimes the use of hard power can undermine the perceptions on which soft power is. But we're not here to talk about the US. I just wanted to, since the topic given to me was soft power, I thought we could lay down what we understand by soft power and then go into it. Nye himself in his, in his next book, The Paradox of American Power, took the theory beyond the US. He said other nations can also acquire it. And he suggested there were three types of countries that could acquire soft power. And I'll quote him again for the last time. Those whose dominant cultures and ideals are closer to prevailing global norms, which he went on to say, now emphasize liberalism, pluralism, and autonomy. Those with the most access to multiple channels of communication and thus have more influence over how issues are framed. And those whose credibility is enhanced by their domestic and international performance. Unquote. Now, of course, this in some ways seems like a prescription for reaffirming the contemporary reality of US dominance, since it's clear that no country scores more highly on these categories than the US itself. But you, if you look through history, of course, soft power has actually been attempted by other countries with great success over the years. When France was uh, defeated in the War of 1870 by Prussia, what are the, one of the most important things it did to rebuild its uh, the nation shattered morale and enhanced its prestige, it created the Alliance Francaise. So that the promotion of French language and literature throughout the world became a substitute for the military um, self-respect, if you like, that it had lost 
at Prussian hands. And, and French culture has remained a major selling point for French diplomacy ever since. And the UK, of course, then followed suit of the British Council, the Swiss with pro Helvetia, Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal have institutes named for Goethe, Cervantes, Dante Alighieri, and Camus. So they've all been pressed into service. China has started establishing Confucius Institutes. I think there are a hundred of them in the United States. Um, and those promote uh, Chinese culture internationally. And the Beijing Olympics uh, were really conceived as a, as a major exercise in the building up of soft power by an authoritarian state. It didn't help, unfortunately, that all the press who came there noticed other things too, apart from the magnificence of the open ceremony. And amongst the best things was when the, during the build up to the Olympics, a lot of press had a reporting about lack of uh, outlets for dissent and freedom of expression. The Chinese announced that they'd been t they would open up half a dozen locations, I think there were seven locations at, at public spaces around the city for anyone to protest, like Hyde Park Corner in London, say anything they wanted to about the state. But of course, to go to protest, you had to apply for a license. <laughs> and as the press covering the Beijing Olympics also reported, um, everyone who applied for a license, without exception, was arrested. So, um, so this exercise in soft power became actually a convenient mechanism for rounding up dissidents, and it also obviously undermined the soft power message. Um, which shows you that a lot of soft power doesn't come very well out of governmental hands. The US itself has officially sponsored initiatives, from the Voice of America to the Fulbright Fellowships, and indeed, the International Visitors Program, on which, as Stuart mentioned earlier today, I, I've come to this country um, uh, and, and had the opportunity to travel through very, very interesting parts of it and have some very frank conversations, including spending a, a day in Miami with a, a, a young Republican activist called Jeb Bush. <laughs> that was amongst the privileges of being an international visitor. But anyway, so America does do official promotion of soft power, but you could well argue that Hollywood and MTV have done far more to promote the idea of America as a desirable and admirable society than any US governmental endeavor could. So soft power, in other words, is created partly by governments and partly despite governments, partly by deliberate action, partly by accident. And this is where I'm going to come straight to India, because what I'm trying to say is that it means acknowledging that India's claims, such as they are to a leadership role in the world of the 21st century, would lie in the aspects and products of Indian society and culture that the world finds attractive, more than just the governmental initiatives, which were also discussed at some length today. Those assets may not directly persuade others to support India, but they go a long way to enhancing India's intangible standing in the world's eyes. And, and that's because the roots of India's soft power run rather deep. India is a civilization that over millennia has offered refuge and more important religious and cultural freedom to all sorts of folks, Jews, Parsis, several varieties of Christians and Muslims. Jews came to the southwestern coast of India several centuries before Christ. Oral legend says they came with the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians. There's certainly more evidence of their coming after the destruction of the second temple by the Romans. And there's even a lovely oral legend that says when St. Thomas of the Bible, doubting Thomas the Apostle, landed on the shores of Kerala sometime around 50, 52 AD, that he was welcomed on shore by a flute-playing Jewish girl. Uh, and what's interesting is that, of course, all these people were welcomed. Uh, this remains the only Jewish diaspora in history never to have known a single instance of anti-Semitic persuasion at Indian hands. In fact, the only uh, anti-Semitic persecution at Indian hands. In fact, the only example of any misbehavior towards them as a community because of their faith came when the Portuguese showed up during the Inquisition in the 1600s and started, uh, 1500s and started persecuting Jews. Um, the conversion of many Indians by St. Thomas uh, gave us a Christian community long before anybody who looks European was ever Christian. Islam came again to the south of India 
not by the sword as to some degree it did in the north, but through travelers, traders, merchants, who had been traveling from the Arab world to India for hundreds of years before the prophet and who brought the message of the prophet with him, so much so that a local king, attracted by the message of the prophet, went off to meet the prophet in his own lifetime, uh, met him, died before he could make it back, but he's left his legacy in the form of coconut trees from Kerala planted right along the coast uh, near Muscat today. If you fly into Oman, you will see these Indian coconut trees that are not native to the Arabian Peninsula, but were, were planted by this Kerala king who went to see the prophet. Uh, in fact, one of another king uh, passed a decree because he was so impressed by the seafaring skills of Muslims that he passed a decree obliging every fisherman's family in his kingdom to bring up one son as a Muslim because he was convinced that only Muslims could sail. Um, so the, 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 the India where the, the wail of the Muslim wazin routinely blends with the chant of mantras at the Hindu temple and where the tinkling of church bells accompanies the Sikh Gurudwara's reading of verses from their holy book, the Guru Granth Sahib, this is the India I think that, that has uh, a, a soft power claim to make on the world. In fact, the, British, the late British historian E.P. Thompson wrote that this heritage of diversity is what makes India, and I'm quoting him, the most important country for the future of the world. All the convergent influences of the world, he said, run through this society. There is not a thought that is being thought in the East or the West that is not active in some Indian mind. Unquote. I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian. But, <laughs> but, but that Indian mind has been shaped by remarkably diverse forces. Ancient Hindu tradition, myth and scripture, the impact of Islam and Christianity, and two centuries of British colonial rule. And the result is unique. Though there are some who think and speak of India as if it were just a Hindu country, Indian civilization actually is an evolved hybrid of all these influences. We cannot speak of Indian culture today without uh, Kabali, which is a Muslim art form, the poetry of Ghalib, which is written in, um, in, in, in the courts of Delhi in the 19th century, or that, for that matter, the game of cricket, which uh, came to us from Britain and is our de facto national sport. In fact, an Indian sociologist rather wittily remarked, cricket is actually an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> <laughs> And when an Indian um, dons something like quote-unquote national dress for a formal event, he wears a variant of what I'm wearing, which actually is a garment based on the Sharwani, which did not exist in India till the Muslim invasions. So this whole question of identifying India with one particular religion or religious faith flies in the face of its own hybrid culture. And, um, and I think it's, it's the breadth and not just the depth of this cultural heritage that India's soft power lies. Um, and the fact that we are such a land of rich diversities and one that doesn't impose narrow conformities on its citizens, that the whole thing about being Indian is that you can be many things and one thing. You can be a, a good Muslim, a good Keralite, and a good Indian all at once, um, which is a, an important lesson, I think, in a world in which we're all trying to grapple with how to manage diversity in this increasingly globalizing world in which there's so much of backlash against immigration and so much of xenophobia, quite frankly, arising. Here you have an India land of uh, one land embracing many. Uh, uh, the idea that a nation may endure within itself vast differences of, of caste, of creed, of color, of culture, of conviction, of cuisine, of costume and custom, and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus is on the democratic principle that you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. Acceptance rather than tolerance is the Indian secret. And I think that's been uh, the strength, to my mind, of India's soft power, that um, it has always managed to maintain consensus on how to manage without consensus. And I think that, that is where we we, 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 we are stronger in the 21st century world because, as I've said earlier, using hard power very often brings with it the odium of mass public disapproval, whereas the blossoming of soft power 
um, lends itself much more easily to the information era. Uh, and I will say that um, in many ways that, that can be the principal asset of a country. We need hard power, of course. Without it, I mean, soft power without hard power is an admission of weakness. Hard power without soft power, though, is bullying and is, is even more unpopular. Um, to my mind, the strength of soft power comes when it's not too deliberate. We are not trying to persuade others overtly or conquer others' hearts. It's it what's, what comes out of your being yourself and that appealing to people. Uh, in fact, I was traveling in the Gulf um, in 2004 for the UN when um, the Indian election results took place at that time. And um, uh, I remember country after country, the senior officials and ministers I was meeting expressing their astonishment and unabashed admiration for the fact that in this in this vast country, we you know we'd had a, an election won by a political party at that point, 2004, led by a woman of Italian background and Roman Catholic faith, who then made way for a Sikh to be sworn in by a Muslim president as prime minister in a country that's 80% Hindu. Natural imperialism, a particularly insidious kind that. Baywatch and Burgers will supplant Bharat Natyam and Bhilpuri and so on. But instead, as we've heard today, the opposite has been happening. And India's own experience with Western consumer products has conclusively demonstrated that we can drink Coca-Cola without becoming coca colonized uh, In fact, Mahatma Gandhi, about 75 years ago, said rather memorably that India should be a house with all its doors and windows open so the winds of the world can blow through our house, so long as we stand firmly on our own feet and are not blown off by those winds. And I think that's the Indian strength. In our popular culture, you just heard about Bollywood, this was, has proved resilient enough to compete successfully with MTV and McDonald's. And to do so abroad, Indian cuisine, for example, the proliferation of Indian restaurants around the world, and I came to graduate school at Fletcher, we had exactly one Indian restaurant in all of New England. It was a place called the India Restaurant, really imagination name, <laughs> on Mass Ave, and it was a bring your own bottle place that didn't have a license. Uh, and I remember you know, my roommate and I making a pilgrimage every month to go and get Indian food. Uh, but the fact is that um, today, I mean, I think you, you, know, you throw a stone anywhere in Massachusetts, you'll hit somebody coming in or out of an Indian restaurant. Um, and, and of course, New York, uh, and so on, even Washington. Um, so. We're seeing a, a transformation. I was asked when I was at the UN to testify before the German Constitutional Court on peacekeeping. And this was in a, an absolutely tiny little town in the countryside called Karlsruhe. And uh, at the end of it, the German foreign minister was extremely happy with what I'd had to say. And as my reward, I was offered a meal of the cuisine of my choice. So I said rather wistfully, well, if you had an Indian restaurant in Karlsruhe, I'd choose one. And he said, we do, and there was one right there in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I, I just feel that, um, you know, the French had long known that the way to people's hearts is through their palates, but uh, without the Indian government doing anything about it, the proliferation of Indian restaurants has actually brought um, this uh, right across the world. And Britain today, for example, uh, not today, about eight, nine years ago, the then Foreign Secretary, the late Robin Cook, declared that Britain's national dish was chicken tikka masala. Uh, and, and today, the UK Indian restaurants, or curry houses as they're called, employ more people in Britain than the shipbuilding, coal mining, and steel making industries combined. So, so the empire can strike back. <laughs> now, so much was said about Bollywood in the last panel that I feel I shouldn't repeat it, um, except perhaps to add basically to the fact that I mean, I, in my UN life, was always struck by the number of African foreign ministers and even heads of government I met who would speak fondly of growing up, um, looking forward to the arrival of the Bollywood movie um, in the nearest town if they were rural people or, or in the capital city, that's where they were. I, I met a, a, a Senegalese UN official who told me about his mother, an illiterate lady from a village uh, in Senegal who would take a bus to Dakar, the capital, once every month just to watch a Bollywood movie. Now, obviously she couldn't understand the dialogue and the subtitles were in French, but she was illiterate so she couldn't read them. 
but our Bollywood movies are made to be understood despite such handicaps. <laughs> and she had a great time watching the films, and, and of course, she left uh, with stars in her eyes about India as a result. And what's striking about all of this is how widespread it is. Um, uh, the Arab world, I mean, I've, I've found myself speaking to um, uh, the gentleman who owned most of the movie theaters in Oman, and I said, what do you show? And he said, mainly or almost entirely Bollywood movies. And I said, you get a lot of Indians coming? He said, 80% of my audience is Arab. Um, I remember an Indian diplomat telling me about 15 years ago that the only posters you could see in Damascus that were as large as those of the then President Hafez al-Assad, who of course was a, nobody dared to have their picture as big as the presidents in Syria. Uh, the only person whose pictures were displayed publicly that that, that big uh, as, as President Assad was the Bollywood star Amitabh Bachchan. Um, Today it might be someone else, I guess, but, but this is what, I mean, uh, Umi Vedya talking about the success of, of, uh, of Bollywood films in China. I think his movie, Three Idiots, is one of the highest grossing movies of all time in China, including Chinese language films. So there is this, this extraordinary appeal. I remember my, my, my son who works for the Washington Post here, and some of you might read, and if you don't, you should. He writes a, an excellent column a foreign affairs column every day on, on, online. Um, but Ishan, when he was uh, stationed in Hong Kong with Time magazine, uh, traveled in China with a Han Chinese girlfriend, and of course, was completely disregarded. The Chinese are quite blatant about their racism, so they were attentive to her, and they pretty much ignored him or treated him as this unwanted interloper, until he says they got to Western China, where uh, in uh, the Uyghur country, in Xinjiang and, and so on, uh, he was greeted everywhere with shouts of Shah Rukh Khan, who was a big Indian movie star at the time. So this is basically soft power. And from the export of Bollywood to Bhangra dances and American campuses, India has demonstrated that it's a player in globalization too, and not just a subject of it. I think Gauri uh, Mirpuri here was talking about um, Southeast Asia and, and the impact of, of, of Indian culture peacefully for, for millennia. It's striking, for example, that there are versions of the Ramayana, the great Indian epic, performed by pretty much every Southeast Asian country, right up to and including the Philippines. I've seen a Philippine ballet of the story of the Ramayana. The best-selling uh, brand of clove cigarettes in Indonesia is called Ramayana. And the national airline is named for the mythical bird, the Garuda, from the Ramayana. And so it goes. So these influences are, are, are rather striking. And what I think India's strength is today is that it benefits from both the future and the past, uh, from the international appeal of its traditional practices, like Ayurveda and yoga that are both accelerating around the globe in popularity. The UN declared the International Day of Yoga, June 21st, and every year we find the newspapers filling up with pictures of all sorts of people performing yoga in public squares and public places and capital cities around the world. Uh, but it also benefits from the appeal of the future, the extraordinary success of Indian IT professionals, going right back to the Y2K scare, if some of you still remember that, when suddenly Indian software geeks saved us all from computers crashing in unison on, at midnight on the 1st of January 2000. And thereafter, of course, we suddenly realized how much um, IT was benefiting from Indian computing and software programming skills to the point where today many Americans in this field in Silicon Valley speak of the IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology, in pretty much the same tone they used to speak of MIT or, or Caltech. And of course, the Indianness of software engineers and developers is almost taken as synonymous with excellence with mathematical and scientific excellence. And this sometimes can have unintended consequences. I've long told the story of a, of a friend of mine who, like me, majored in history, uh, who was transiting through Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and was approached by an anxiously perspiring European saying, you're Indian, you're Indian, can you help me fix my laptop? <laughs> you know, when I first came to this country, the old stereotype about Indians was, uh, snake charmers and, and, and naked fakirs lying on beds of nails. Now it's that every Indian must be a mathematical whiz, a software geek, a computer expert. But all of that help, that's all, that actually is all part of India's soft power. 
And India's success in this area, I suggest, uh, is, is one that has increasingly uh, been reflected in, in the extent to which the country is becoming a global player. You take something like the small budget nano car, the Tata Nano, uh, it, it's, a, it's a domestic marketing disaster in India because unfortunately they tried to market it as the cheapest car in the world and somehow nobody wanted to see themselves driving the cheapest car in the world. Um, bad, bad sales promotion. But as, as, as a triumph of no frills engineering to world-class standards, it took the Geneva Auto Salon by storm. Um, but of course, at the same time, the same company, Tata, also acquired and turned around Jaguar Land Rover. And that means that if the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, wins re-election today, she will have to drive to Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen and reclaim her mandate in an Indian car. <laughs> the Prime Minister drives a Jaguar. And what's worse, she'll be escorted by cops in another Indian car, the Land Rover. So uh, I know that may not be enough to send a post-colonial frisson through American minds. So how about this? When the founder of the, the Tata business dynasty, Jamshedji Tata, uh, tried in the teeth of British hostility and colonial opposition to set up a steel plant, a modern steel plant in the late 19th century. Uh, in fact, they put so many hurdles in his way that it took 20 years and he died before the first ingot could come out of the factory. But the fact is that while he was trying to do that, a senior British official, the chairman of the Imperial Railway Board, sneered that he would personally eat every ounce of steel that an Indian was capable of producing. It's a pity he didn't live long enough to see the descendants of the same Jim Shedji Tata acquire the remnants of British steel when they bought Chorus. Might have given him a bad case of indigestion. <laughs> and this, this, this same Tata, by the way, was denied admission to a, uh, a famous uh, whites-only hotel called Watson's Hotel in Bombay, uh, which had a sign saying Indians and dogs not allowed. And uh, so he went off and built a, a far grander, more opulent hotel uh, it's called the Taj Mahal Hotel, and it's now one of the luxury hotels in the world, whereas the hotel he was kicked out of, Watson's, has long since closed. So the Indians have a hotel to go to. I don't know about the dogs. Now, Joseph Nye has essentially explained that in the information age, as I said, it's not the country with the bigger army that wins. It's always a side with a better story. And India has been for a very long time the land of the better story a society with a free press and a thriving mass media, where the people as creative energies are daily encouraged to express themselves in a variety of appealing ways, that gives India the extraordinary ability to tell stories that are more persuasive and attractive than those of its rivals. In fact, this is not about propaganda. I would argue it will not work if it is directed by the government. Its impact can be and has been huge, but it will be huge, particularly uh, because it comes spontaneously from the culture of a society. I'll give you one example because I can see the clock is ticking on past our, our sell-by date. But the one example I'd give you is about um, Afghanistan where so many American soldiers have served and so many have lost their lives. Uh, India doesn't have soldiers there, not least because our neighbors wouldn't welcome it for good reason, perhaps, or bad. But uh, what we did have was a television soap opera uh, called Kyunki Saas Bhi Kavi Bahuti. Uh, forget about the translation, it's a clunky title. But it was the most popular soap opera on Afghan television, dubbed into Dari. It captured eyeballs, 92% of all TV sets tuned in Afghanistan to this show. You couldn't get an Afghan at 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, so much so, there were complaints of absences from religious functions. The mullah started rising up against this. Weddings were being interrupted so that people could go and watch the show for half an hour before turning their attention back to the bride and the groom. Thefts went up at that time. There was an astonishing story by Reuters, a British news agency, not Indian propaganda, of, a, of an incident in Mazari Sharif when um, uh, 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 at, at, at this particular time of the evening, a robber came and stripped a very fancy luxury car of every detachable part the hubcaps, the spokes, the wheels, the, 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 the windshield wipers, the side view mirrors, everything stripped off. And then the thieves wrote gratefully on the windshield, Tulsi Zindabad, which means long live Tulsi, the heroine of the soap opera. <laughs> Obviously the, the security guys are busy watching the TV screen rather than minding the store. Now this is, 
This is soft power, and you don't have to thank the government for it. It's, it's, all about, um, it's all about things that Indians are doing for themselves, that in this case, a neighboring country that's of some strategic value to India finds deeply attractive. So uh, when people argue that you know, cultural diplomacy, the subject of today's seminar, today's conference, um, is, is important and so on, they tend to focus about on, on what governments can do to promote cultural diplomacy, to promote culture, to showcase culture. Um, I believe that the message that really matters, because it's what gets through whether you like it or not, is not what you're trying to show, but really who and what you are. And as an opposition member of parliament, that's my message to the Indian government too. Don't change this about India. Don't try to remake India in a way that undermines your soft power, because you'll find you're damaging an enormous asset. I mean, so far, there's been an enormous amount of controversy in India that I don't need to enter into now, unless any of you have questions about it. Um, but we, as a society, um, have celebrated our own diversity, our own pluralism, our own democracy, our own freedoms, in a way that is implied we take them for granted, that we get complacent about them. Some recent trends have unfortunately given free reign to others who have promoted attitudes of, of, uh, of bigotry and intolerance that should have no place in the narrative that I've just given you. But they're also an inescapable part, sadly, of today's Indian reality. And that's why people like me feel it's so important to resist them. Resist them not in a purely political bipartisan spirit, but rather as proud Indians, because we are conscious of what we are proud of in our civilization. We are conscious of the qualities that are so attractive about our culture that give us soft power in the world. And we don't want to see those qualities undermined by recklessly irresponsible often semi-educated people who have been given a free hand by those in power who should know better. And, and I, I, I'm just going to point to the fact that, um, that China and Russia have realized that you know, Kung, Fu ballet, Kung, Kung Fu movies and the Bolshoi Ballet uh, will win more admirers internationally than the People's Liberation Army uh, or, 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 or even oil and gas reserves. Uh, uh, but, but the fact is that, um, that you need to be able to be the kind of society that produces and creates those things that others want to see and share and enjoy. Um, we have to solve our internal problems. That's our problem, not yours. Um, before we can truly aspire to play a role of leadership in the world. Um, and we are in the process of doing precisely that. Uh, we want, uh, I think, to conquer the challenges of development because keeping our people healthy, well-fed, uh, and free of the, not just jihadi terrorism, but the daily terror of hunger, of poverty, of ill health, that's also part of our responsibility as a society. But if we do all of that and we get it right, uh, and we can do it through a functioning, flourishing, thriving democracy with a free press, with our contentious civil society forums, with our overactive human rights groups and NGOs, uh, with the remarkable spectacle of our free and fair democratic elections. All of these, I think, will make India uh, a truly successful example of the management of diversity in our globalizing world. And I think uh, it's important, for example, that despite some of the recent things we've been reading uh, here in the American papers, that the press uh, not be interfered with, that the press remains lively, free, irreverent, and disdainful of sacred cows. Because our civilizational ethos has been a, an extraordinary, immeasurable asset for our country, and it's vital that we don't allow the specter of religious intolerance or political opportunism, very often it's the latter masquerading as the former or using the former for the latter, to undermine the soft power that's our greatest asset in the 21st century, because I think that the respect that we want as a world leader will come for us if we are a society truly worth admiring and respecting, which is indeed the India that I believe has long existed well before any of us who are jockeying for power in India today have come, come, come around. It's a long-standing civilizational asset of what we are, and, and, and I think that this country, uh, 
with all these qualities inherited from millennia of, of living as an example of this sort of culture will, I believe, have the soft power that will make it truly an influential leader in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Can you take up the question? No, no, I think we're good.